Luke 16, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? And he answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? And he replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes." Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please forgive me if you have heard me tell the following joke one too many times, but it is perfect for today's parable, so I just couldn't resist telling it one more time. One day, a wealthy businessman was riding in his limousine when he saw two men along the side of the road eating grass. Disturbed at this, he yelled at his driver to stop, and he got out to investigate. He asked the first man, why are you eating the grass? Well, said the man, we don't have any money for food, so we have to eat grass. Well then, said the businessman, come with me to my house, and I will feed you. But sir, the poor man replied, I also have a wife and two children with me. They're over there behind that tree. Okay, bring them along too, the businessman replied. Turning to the other poor man, he stated, You come with us also. But the second man, in a pitiful voice, said, But sir, I also have a wife and seven children here with me. Very well then said the businessman. Bring them all. And so they all piled into the limousine, which was no easy task in itself. And once they got underway, one of the poor fellows turned to the businessman and said, Sir, you are truly too kind. Thank you for taking all of us with you. The businessman replied, No problem. I'm glad I could help. Besides, you'll really love my place. The grass is almost a foot high. Today's parable is about an unscrupulous businessman, someone who seems pretty unlikable in all respects, and yet Jesus himself commends this character and says that we should be more like him. Now, this is probably one of the most difficult and perplexing parables in all the teachings of Jesus. And there have been just as many interpretations of this parable as there have been readers and interpreters of it in the past 2,000 years. 
My approach, as you already know, is to ask the question, who am I in this story? Or who are we in this story? And last week, I suggested that as wealthy Americans, we could best identify with the rich landowner in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. But in today's parable, even though it begins with a certain rich man, I'm not so sure he's the one that I can identify with most in this story. On the other hand, the dishonest, unscrupulous manager who squanders all that has been entrusted to him, and when his actions finally catch up to him, he risks losing everything and being thrown out onto the street too weak for manual labor and too proud to beg. I can identify with that guy. That may come as a surprise to some of you. But years ago, when I first began to sense that God was calling me into ministry as a pastor, my honest reaction was, hell no. I'm not qualified to be anyone's role model. I know what goes on in the deepest, darkest recesses of this brain. I know all of the horrible things that I do when I think no one is watching me. I was not then, and I am not today, by any stretch of the imagination, a good person. And of course, my closest friends from childhood and all of my family members are very happy to validate this for me. When I told them that I was considering becoming a pastor, they said, you? A pastor? Are you sure about that? But I have spent the last eight years of my life dreading the day when I finally screw things up and everyone finally realizes, what were we thinking? That guy is a mess. He should never have even set foot inside a church, let alone think that he could actually run one. And when that day comes, I've often wondered, what will I do then? Like the character in our story, I am too weak to dig and too proud to beg. But maybe, I always think to myself, maybe when I really screw things up, maybe someone, somewhere, will remember something nice that I did for them something kind, and maybe, just maybe, the judgment I truly deserve will be tempered with a little bit of mercy, which I don't deserve. And then, maybe then, there will still be a small place for me in our community. So yes, I can identify with the dishonest manager in this parable all of his flaws, and all of his desperation to redeem himself in his hour of judgment. But there's another interpretation of this parable that really intrigues me. And although I didn't come up with it myself, it is predictably not a common interpretation. It's not a very popular one for reasons which I think will be pretty obvious. I've said that I ask the question, who am I or who are we in the story? But there's another question you can ask when you're trying to understand the parables of Jesus. And that question is, who is Jesus in this parable? Or who is God in this story? Now, in a lot of the parables, God is, in fact, the rich man, the landowner, the one who owns everything, controls everything, the one who executes judgment as well as extends mercy. And that makes sense, God being God and all. In this parable, I do think that the rich man to whom everyone is indebted is clearly God. We owe everything we have, everything we've been given to God, our creator, our provider. And yet, if we're honest, most of us fail to live up to God's expectations. We fall short of them. 
and therefore we are in debt to our provider, and we cannot possibly pay the bill. So who are we in this story? I think we're the debtors, the, one, the ones who owe the hundred bushels of olive oil or grain. And God, of course, is the rich master. But there's another character. It's our dishonest manager, right? And God chooses to send an intermediary, a middle manager, if you will, to the debtors in order to negotiate that balance due. And I think that's Jesus. I think Jesus is the dishonest manager in this story. Wait a minute, Pastor Neil. Are you saying that Jesus is dishonest? Are you saying that Jesus is unscrupulous? That Jesus is the bad guy? Maybe you were right about not being qualified to be a pastor. But hear me out, and let's take a closer look. In the beginning of the story, as Jesus is telling this story to his audience, he doesn't actually say that the manager is dishonest. He says in verse 1 that charges were brought to the rich man that the manager was squandering or wasting his property. And we should probably ask the question, who's bringing those charges against the manager? Because in the Gospel of Luke, charges are repeatedly brought against Jesus by the religious leaders of his day. Charges that he associates with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. Wasting his time and wasting his God-given talent on hopeless people that the religious leaders believed God had already condemned and forsaken. Now, in our parable, the boss, the master who represents God, does not exactly agree or disagree with the charges that are brought to him. He doesn't quite weigh in on the charges themselves. Instead, he says to his manager, what is this I hear? Give me an accounting of your management. Fair enough. But then he says, because you cannot be my manager any longer. And that sounds like you're fired. And that sounds a little bit harsh, just on charges alone. But in the Greek language in which Luke's gospel is written, that phrase is a little bit more ambiguous. It could be translated as, you cannot be my manager any longer, but it could also just as easily be translated as, you will not be my manager for very much longer. And that makes sense if you think of Jesus as the manager, Jesus whose time on earth was limited and was coming to an end. In other words, your time on this earth, your ministry of management is quickly coming to an end. And so the manager then asks himself, what can I do now so that people will welcome me, and perhaps he means my message, my teachings, into their homes for years and decades and centuries to come? What can I do? I know. And Jesus goes out to the sinners, the debtors, the unforgivable people of the world and says, I forgive you in the name of my boss, in the name of my father. Now, in this parable, the manager does not forgive the entirety of the debt, and we like to think that Jesus forgives all of our sins. But I believe that what the manager is actually forgiving is the portion of the debt which the debtors are unable to pay and will always be unable to pay. You see, we still give to God whatever we can, even though we know we will fall short. But then Jesus steps in and writes off all that we cannot pay. And then in verse 8, Jesus continues the story saying, and his master commended the dishonest manager. And here Jesus actually does use the word dishonest. But I think in light of this understanding of the story, maybe when he says it, he says it with a wink and a smile to his followers. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly, wisely, 
passionately. And this is where the parable ends. But then Jesus keeps on going, and he adds to it several sayings about money and possessions. Now, biblical scholars have debated for centuries whether these sayings are actually connected with the parable in some way, or whether Luke, the writer of the gospel, is simply adding all of his spare, Jesus talks about money stories at the end of a parable that seems pretty well on the surface to be about money. I'm not going to resolve that debate today, but I do think that the parable has a lot to say about generosity. The generosity of the manager who forgives the debts of the people. The generosity of his master who, instead of getting mad at him for doing that, commends him and praises him for his wisdom. The implied generosity of all the people who will welcome the manager into their homes when and if he loses his position. And so the sayings that come after the parable are also, I think, about generosity. Beginning in verse 10, Jesus says, Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful in much. Whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? I often hear people tell me, Pastor, I would love to be more generous in my giving to the church or to charities or to good causes or whatever, but I just don't have that much to give. If God would only bless me by helping me to win the lottery or with a raise or by changing my circumstances, then, then I will be more generous. But here, Jesus is pretty clearly saying that if you can't be generous with what you already have, what makes you think that you actually would be generous if God gave you more? Because a habit is a habit. If you have developed the habit of not being generous, maybe out of fear or out of caution or whatever excuse comes to mind, then you will most likely carry forward that habit, those excuses, even if your circumstances change. So, I think Jesus is saying, be generous now. As a pastor, I can tell you I've certainly witnessed and been humbled by great acts of generosity from wealthy people and from very poor people as well. And it, neither of these groups are generous because of what they have or don't have. They're generous because of who they are, and it shows. So who are you today, and who will you choose to be? In rural Africa, a farmer will catch a troublesome monkey who has been destroying his property by carving a hole in a tree and placing some food just inside the hole. Now, the hole is just large enough for the monkey to fit his hand inside it. But when he grabs the food, his fist becomes too big to remove from the hole. And instead of letting go of the food and running away, the monkey will continue to struggle and pull and fight against the tree while the farmer runs up and hits the monkey over the head with a club. Or I suppose if it's a kind and compassionate farmer, he might simply catch the monkey and release him elsewhere. But either way, we hear this story and we laugh at the monkey and we say, stupid monkey, why not just let go of the food and save your life? But the joke is on us, because we're a whole lot like that monkey. We get so caught up in clinging to whatever great or pitiful possessions, property, or money that we have. And we cling to them so tightly, and we fail to realize the looming danger to our lives and to our freedom that clinging to such things brings. You see, it's only in letting go 
that we may be truly free to live. The dishonest manager in today's parable lets go of his position, his pride, his fear, in order to be generous with what has been entrusted to him. In doing this, he finds freedom, life, the praise of his master, and the praise of his fellow human beings. And friends, that is great news for a dishonest, unscrupulous, ungenerous, stubborn, self-righteous sinner like me. Let us pray. Lord, each day that you have given us is truly a gift. And yet how many of those days do we let fly by us without taking the time to say thank you, without taking the time to share the gift with another person? Help us to open our eyes, open our ears, open our minds and our hearts to the world around us, to the need that there is among our neighbors and help us to be generous with what we have been given. Help us always to share with others. Lead us in the direction and in the example of your son who gave himself for us completely so that we might know freedom, that we might know love and generosity and kindness. Help us in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions to be kind and to be generous to everyone we meet. We pray all these things just as you taught your disciples to pray when we say the words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.